Welcome to Crossroads. In today's episode, we'll be talking about the growing welfare state and the agenda to create universal basic income everywhere. And this ties into as well a push for global climate reparations. And I'll explain to you how this whole system works. Uh, briefly, folks, I am in Taiwan right now covering the elections and, of course, covering what's going to happen as it relates to whether Taiwan chooses to align itself with the United States or with the Chinese Communist Party. This is going to be a crucial election, and we're, we'll be here live counting the votes or watching the votes get counted on the weekend. So stay tuned for that. We're also going to, ha we're also going to have a special feature coming out uh, hopefully soon after, kind of breaking everything down. So that's going to be only on Epic TV coming up very soon, as soon as, it, as soon as things are said and done here, of course. Now, first of all, though, something else. There is a large-scale push in the United States and other places as well, pushing for new policies of universal basic income. Now, this means that basically you don't have to work and you get a paycheck from the government every single month just for existing. Some of these proposals are being done as, you know, quote-unquote solutions to climate change. Other forms of this are being proposed as solutions to a future where, well, artificial intelligence has rendered many American jobs obsolete. If you're wondering what those poor writers of Hollywood are going to do for a living, well, maybe nothing. They might just get a universal basic income paycheck, and that's going to be life. Look, either way now, though... This new form of wealth redistribution could usher in a new program for a nationwide welfare state, and it's actually not even technically partisan. There are some people on the conservative side also very much on board with this as well. I'll explain it to you. Now, first off, on the climate change front, there are huge amounts of money being pledged and collected as a type of global repayment system for so-called climate reparations. Let me show you some of this. Slay News says that when the United Nations Climate Summit drew to its close in mid-December, globalist governments around the world were pledging billions of dollars in taxpayer money to fight the so-called climate crisis. Democrat President Joe Biden's administration joined other Western governments in pledging billions for climate reparations and a, quote, green climate fund. It notes that right at the start, Western governments in Japan pledged large, su large sums for what is being portrayed as climate reparations, dubbed the Loss and Damages Fund by the United Nations and its members. The narrative behind it holds that since freer Western people developed first, they have put more CO2 into the atmosphere and therefore must pay third world governments who misrule poverty-stricken populations for the alleged harm caused. In other words, it's a global welfare system. Western countries, the United States, most of Europe, even Japan, because they say that we're responsible for CO2 emissions, is paying reparations. All these countries are paying reparations to many third world governments. Now, the irony with part of this is that a lot of these third world countries create like a ridiculous amount of pollution, but that's a whole nother issue. This article notes that on the first day of the 28th conference of the parties, that's COP28, the big, uh, the big climate change summit they had in Dubai, it notes the governments began making pledges on behalf of their taxpayers. And so if you're wondering, well, my government didn't talk about this, I didn't hear anything about it, well, they probably did, but they just didn't tell you that clearly. It notes that the German government pledged $100 million. Japanese authorities promised to hand over $10 million just as a start. The Biden administration pledged $17.5 million to this global reparations fund. It notes that the unelected leaders of the European Union, the EU, vowed to offer 200 million euros in taxpayer money. It notes that third world regimes are demanding at least 100 billion dollars every single year just for this fund alone. And if you're wondering what are they going to do with that 100 billion dollars every single year, I would assume that based on the fact we give a lot of these countries a lot of money already, it's probably not going to go to the average citizen. Just a hunch given how these things have been used in the past. But 
It notes that they claim the cash is needed for what they call climate justice because we've apparently committed injustices against them just by existing in the world and breathing out CO2. It notes the fund, which will be housed at the World Bank, notably, for now, as policymakers try to find a permanent home for it, is actually separate from another one, which is the infamous Green Climate Slush Fund. It notes that fund, which has been in existence for years, is being used to bribe third world governments into keeping their people in poverty by prohibiting abundant energy and restricting resource development. It notes that Biden and Obama have funneled billions, with a B, of U.S. taxpayer dollars into that one already in flagrant disgrace, uh, defiance of federal law. And you know what? We can see what good it's done for those countries. Not a whole lot, especially because they're fleeing in vast numbers and deciding to just go collect those reparations in person. And they're, of course, coming to the United States through our open border. And they're, of course, flooding into Europe also through the Open Borders program. So on this note, though, you know, climate justice, reparations, global payments for alleged damages caused by our lifestyles, and us driving cars and you know taking up take, taking up the world's energy although again all those countries do the same although worse in terms of pollution this is the big narrative that being said though this is not just for a program of global reparations and global free handouts and essentially a global welfare state being propped up by first world countries the united states europe japan but also something being, being proposed tying into a global welfare system, including in Western countries. And keep in mind that a lot of Western countries, the United States and others, are being flooded by individuals from a lot of these third world countries under the narrative of climate, you know, climate change and they're fleeing climate change and they're seeking amnesty because you know, apparently climate change is harming. That's the big narrative, right? They're, this is being framed in terms of race and reparations and the whole nine yards. Keep in mind that tied in with all of this, globally, no matter where you are, is a new concept of global social welfare. What they're proposing is a globalist system of wealth redistribution. It's not just the bourgeoisie and the proletariat of the you know, communist movement in one country or other. This is a global system where, again, the, you know, the bourgeoisie are going to be people in a certain country and they're going to be giving payments to people in other countries to create universal equity. But they're also talking about the idea of universal basic income. Every single person gets a paycheck every single month from the government. And if you choose to work, you're going to be the one paying into that fund. If you choose not to work, well, all power to you. You can sit at home and do whatever you want. New York Post notes that Democratic presidential candidate, Representative Dean Phillips, broke with President Biden's views on reparations and universal basic, basic income in an exclusive interview with the Post, revealing new details about his campaign platform. It notes that Phillips confirmed he would embrace paying reparations to African Americans for slavery and experiment with universal basic income. Both proposals associated with the left wing of the Democrat Party. In other words, this is more from the, the further left elements within the Democrat Party. It notes that Phillips also said he would be open to experimenting with universal basic income due to the onset of artificial intelligence and said this, I do believe a UBI pilot should be initiated. He said there have been some, I think it's time to do more because we are going to lose millions of jobs to artificial intelligence, and right now we do not have any plan to address it. Now, let me explain this a bit more, because this is actually not just a far left issue as it's being portrayed as. This is technically not just in, you know, in terms of what's happening there. This is also something coming very much from the right. This is also coming from conservatives. It's coming from libertarians, surprisingly. And it's coming from a lot of the folks pushing kind of the big tech agendas. Because right now we're dealing with a situation possibly for the entire world where artificial intelligence 
is going to be taking away, interestingly, most of the creative jobs. Uh, this means, of course, that you're still going to need your people, you know, picking fruit and growing vegetables and cleaning toilets and all that. But for the the uh, the elites who you know typically write the Hollywood scripts and so on, or the artists, they're going to be out of work is uh, what they're proposing essentially. Now remember that UBI, Universal Basic Income, will very likely go hand in hand with the rollout of artificial intelligence. This isn't even just a fringe idea. This isn't like, you know, as they talked about the Post being some, you know, the left wing of the Democrat Party, the, you know, the socialist movement of that faction. This is being proposed as a relatively sweeping solution, no matter where you stand, on solutions to offset loss from AI. This is the direction the world is heading in, in other words, with AI. Now, one of these individuals pushing it, uh, Wilderquist of OpenAI, believes at least, it says, according to The Guardian, in the short term that the growth of AI will push white-collar workers into the gig economy and into other platforms of poorly paid, insecure work. He notes that such a shift in the world workforce, he fears, drive down wages and conditions while increasing inequality. It notes that a UBI policy, universal basic income, in response to AI and to automation, in other words, the robots taking away a lot of the manufacturing jobs, the, the robot kiosks running your fast food restaurants, these issues would address, of course, the failure, UBI, of employers to distribute the spoils of economic growth. In other words, as companies realize it's getting too expensive to hire human beings and they don't want to pay money to artists or Hollywood script writers or to you know, people working the cashiers at restaurants and decide to instead to use AI or automation, it notes that these companies are going to get more money because they're using robots or AI and so they should have to pay the would-be workers who would have been there regardless. And it notes that this is propelled at least in part by automation fairly among workers according to this individual. It notes that some go further than that, pointing to UBI, Universal Basic Income, as a dividend that is due. You have to pay it off to workers for their role in the development and dissemination of knowledge used to train AI models such as ChatGPT. In other words, if you use Facebook or, you know, I guess technically Twitter stuff. I don't know if they still do much data gathering. Or if you just use Google or Siri or anything else. Any program that takes your data or any program that any, anything you publish that is being scraped by AI in order to train its models. In other words, anybody who uses the internet or who has a smartphone has in some ways contributed to the education of an AI system because they scrape everything. And so because technically AI is pulling from the creative works of every single person who uses a smartphone or computer or the internet, that we've all contributed to its creation and so should get reparations for that. It notes that Scott Sant Santin's editor of website Basic Income Today said, quote, that it should, should only one or two companies get rich off the capital, the human work that we all created. And notes that if in the future workers do find themselves made redundant by automation and unable to secure new positions, then UBI, Universal Basic Income, offers a similarly promising option. Now, it notes as well, again, this isn't just a left-wing idea. We've been talking about it very much in terms of that, but let me show you the other side of it. Even Elon Musk, who I'd frame as more libertarian person, I don't know where he technically stands, but even Elon Musk is talking about this. Fortune magazine said that while speaking at the UK's inaugural AI safety summit just recently, the founder, investor, and CEO Elon Musk of many companies predicted that AI would inevitably remove the need for all jobs. Now, I'd question how you're going to have AI, you know, pick corn or something like that, but all jobs, apparently, maybe they're going to find some kind of robotic AI system. That's what he's suggesting. And he said, it's hard to say exactly what the moment is, but there will come a point where no job is needed. None. He says, you can have a job if you want to have a job or sort of a personal satisfaction, 
but the AI, the artificial intelligence, will be able to do everything. He said, I think everyone will have access to this magic genie and you're able to ask any question. It'll certainly be bigger for education. It'll be the best tutor and there'll be no shortage of goods and services. It will be an age of abundance. And he noted that AI will lead to a universal basic income. He's suggesting an apparent superior to universal basic income. Sorry, it's about universal high income. In other words, you don't just get basic income, you make a lot of money, he's saying, which other figures like Sam, Sam Altman, sorry, of OpenAI, and Mark Zuckerberg have advocated for. And he said, quote, we won't have universal basic income. We'll have universal high income. And he noted that in some sense, it'll be somewhat of a leveler, an equalizer. Everybody will be equal under our AI overlords. I'll give my take on some of that as well, but stick with me. Now look, just to emphasize how broad this push is, because I've been saying, you know, it's a lot of people pushing for it. Let me just give you a sample. Stanford University said, is the rise of AI the best argument for universal basic income? Could artificial intelligence replace hundreds of millions of jobs in the near future? Well, Stanford Digital Economy Lab director discusses the employment over the next decade. Vox says how windfall profits from AI companies could fund a universal basic income. Companies like OpenAI and Google could make unthinkable profits from successful AI. Will they share the wealth? Newsweek says AI is about to decimate millions of jobs. It's time for universal basic income. And look, I could keep pulling up articles and headlines on this. This is the agenda. This is the agenda coming from many different sides right now. This is the agenda for the future of the world. Universal basic income, global welfare systems, equity, the entire, you know, whole nine yards. And if you read what they actually say, there's some different experiments on it. There's different takes on what it would look like. Some of them have talked about, you know, just giving people a little bit of money. Some have talked about giving people a lot of money. And of course, you know, it depends on which one you're looking at. There have been some studies on this, including in some parts in the United States, where they have, in fact, already deployed some of it. Uh, Business Insider notes that a growing number of U.S. cities and states are similarly running basic income experiments for communities in need. It notes that the Denver Basic Income Project, one example of this, was created in 2021. They had just 800 homeless individuals in Denver back in October. And it notes that the recipients received up to $1,000 a month. And while the latest results were taken just six months into the study, it found that the group that received a lump sum payment reported a decline from 10% sleeping outdoors to 3%. In other words, you know, about, uh, you know, just a handful of them decided to get homes. The majority, but still not all of them. Now, I would argue that, frankly, the welfare system in itself represents a type of universal basic income. And we don't need to look at, you know, essentially giving free handouts of money to people who don't actually technically need it. Uh, people who don't qualify for normal welfare. Uh, but of course, that is one of the ways that they're framing it as being different, notably, from social welfare. Uh, at the same time, though, I would say that universal basic income has a lot of really serious problems. And let me give some of my takes before we jump into questions. I would say that even though this is being done in some Republican states, which is actually important to note, this isn't just being done in your New York or your California. Uh, this is being done in some very red states. They're trying it out. There are some really, there are also programs trying to push this a whole lot further Again, you even have Elon Musk talking about global reparations, well, in terms of universal basic income um, or, you know, high income. Very much they're pushing this using the green narratives. They're using the, uh, of course, the, the entire climate change narrative, suggesting this should even be, to an extent, a global program. You know, free handouts under the narratives of reparations or artificial intelligence taking jobs or just, you know, frankly, global inequity and blaming us for taking the wealth of the world. We could argue that free housing and everything else going to the, the illegal immigrants is already part of this agenda. 
Because remember, a lot of the mass migration you know, into the United States right now, the hundreds of thousands coming to the U.S. every single month, demanding free homes and free food and just free handouts, they're not working for it. They're getting it without cost, without having to put in labor. That is already a type of global reparation. These individuals are coming to our countries, whether it be the United States or Canada or Western Europe mostly. Uh, but they're also, of course, demanding free handouts and applying for amnesty. And one of the ways they're getting amnesty is under the narrative, of course, of climate change. You know, they're, they're climate refugees is the way they're being framed. Now, look, I would point out some real problems with universal basic income. I understand that we're talking about a very strange future we're heading into as a world right now. We don't really know how many jobs AI is going to take over. We don't really know what it's going to mean as it develops further. We don't know what it means as we start putting AI into computer chips, which they're already starting to do, into smartphones, which a lot of the new smartphone models coming out are starting to implement AI fundamentally at the chip level. Uh, we don't know what it's going to do to our society. We don't know what it means if you have, like, they're even building, for example, like robots that can take care of your dog. Uh, some of you might have those little sweeper robots that clean your house. They're going to have ones very soon with AI built into them. They can actually interact with you or with your pets. Uh, we, this, this is at the very start of all this. We don't know what effect it's going to have. Um, also, when you get into manufacturing, coding for that matter, or if you need to have a type of robotic system that has a physical form, what happens when you start implementing AI into a physical robotic system? Well, that's where you get into what Elon Musk is talking about, where you could have just about all jobs replaced by AI. But I would also argue there are some jobs that are dependent on, I think, humans, at least for the, the very long term currently. You know, what about doctors? Sure, you could have AI assisting doctors in terms of diagnosis, but you still need to have people who are part of that process. You know, what about lawyers? What happens if you get a lawsuit? What happens if you need to defend yourself in court? Would you trust an AI to write your you know, defense or something like that? You have had cases where lawyers have tried using AI and they end up like making up laws and weird things like that. In fact, judges are warning lawyers to not do it because of those types of problems. That actually happened to Michael Cohen, by the way. What about military? Are we going to have robots fight all of our wars for us? What will that look like? What about police? Yes, they do have robotic police going around, but they're not exactly doing the work that police normally can. What about paramedics and ambulances? What about farmers? What about people who cook food in restaurants? Yes, you can have them running the, uh, the kiosks in terms of taking orders, but what about pre preparing the food, doing the orders, buying things, transporting things, and so on? What about people who pick the fruit in fields or the farmers who grow our food in the first place? If we defer everything to AI, what then happens to all these jobs? Now, I would argue there are also a lot of blue-collar jobs, the plumbers, the construction workers, the electricians, individuals who are not dealing with cut-and-dry things you can just have a robot do and need to deal with oftentimes constructing, building new things, or dealing with the messes left behind by previous electricians who might have come by, and anybody who's worked in that field understands that. They're not exactly things that can be replaced with AI. And what about all those dirty jobs that nobody wants to do these days? The jobs that keep societies running. The jobs that work as the foundations of you know, keeping modern societies functioning as modern societies and preventing the decay of modern civilization. What happens if we, if we defer all of those jobs to robots and AI in the future and suddenly the power goes out? And we're left realizing that we have no knowledge of how to maintain any of these systems ourselves, to do any of these jobs ourselves. And we go back to the caveman days because none of us have worked any full-time jobs because we've been used to getting universal basic income. What happens then? And I would argue that, look, the universal basic income argument is something they're already pushing. The future where every single job could be replaced by robotic AI is still very far off. It is possible practically right now that a lot of writing jobs, a lot of computer coding jobs, 
Um, a lot of jobs when it comes to, you know, writing Hollywood scripts or, you know, artistic works and so on. A lot of them, yes, can be replaced by AI to an extent. There are some limits to it. You do still, at the current state, you do still need to have people who do the basic work. I would even say that among journalists, yes, you can have AI write articles on news happening in the world, but the reporting cannot be replaced by AI. The initial journalist who goes out and finds the stories, goes to the press conference, goes to the event, goes on the ground and researches something, you cannot replace that with AI. AI can only take things that have already been done and then rework them into new forms. And so the people who copy journalism, yes, they're going to be replaced by AI, AI probably, but actual journalists who do the on-the-ground work, you're not going to replace that anytime soon. And if you do try to replace it, it's going to be based solely on whatever is fed to them, meaning you're going to have a global propaganda state if you try to defer all of that to AI. Now, I would say, in other words, that there are still a lot of jobs that are not going to be taken by AI anytime soon. And so as they're pushing, as we speak, for the universal rollout of universal basic income and global reparations and essentially a global welfare state using this system, you're still going to have some people who have to work. And I would question, what incentive are you going to give people to do the difficult physical labor jobs? Not the, you know, blue collar, not, not the white collar jobs. AI is taking the white collar jobs. What about the blue collar jobs? The ones where you have, to, you have to actually get your hands dirty. The ones where you have to jump into the sewers and unplug things. The ones where you have to actually go out and work very hard in the fields every day. The jobs that lazy people do not want to do. <laughs> Even some not very lazy people don't like to do because it's a lot of work. What are you going to do with those and what incentive are you going to give people to work long hours doing very hard labor when they don't have to? Why would some people would be, be willing to work to pay into a welfare state where their paycheck is going to be robbed by people who just don't feel like working? Why are they going to go out and work to pay the bills for people who don't want to work? And if you want to have universal basic income, you're going to have a lot of people, of course, deciding just to not work at all. What incentive are you creating then for people to decide to do the work that nobody else wants to do? And I would question very seriously what happens to society if all these people who keep society running decide they just don't want to do it anymore. Well, that's going to be the collapse of society at that point. And of course, I think that this is one of the key failings we've always seen in socialist systems. It's one of the key failings of the Soviet Union. It's one of the key failings of every system, every government on earth that has ever tried to implement true communism. You know, universal equity, universal basic income, this stuff has been done before. What happens or what incentive do you give to people to actually work hard if, whether they work hard or not, they get the same results? If you work 12 hours a day, you get the same result as somebody who worked two hours a day. If you've gone to school to become a doctor, you got your PhD, you spent you know, 10, 15, 20 years uh, training for something, learning a field, and you get the same outcome, the same results as somebody who didn't do any of that. What incentive do you have to put in the work? And that's what happens over and over and over again with these systems, where in the Soviet Union they said, you know what? They, pre they pretend to pay us, and we pretend to work. And as people stop caring and stop putting an effort and realize that it doesn't matter whether they work hard or not, society begins to collapse. Society begins to crumble. We've gone through this again and again and again as human society. We've witnessed the results of these things, and still you have people pushing for it under new systems. This time again, it's global climate change and universal basic income because of AI. That's the new narrative, but it's the same old system. And I would argue we're going to see very quickly the same problems of that that we've already seen again and again and again. All right, folks, that's us jump into some questions. Now, let's see here. Um, from Richard Hon Honimar, 
Um, actually, before we go into questions, uh, real quick, I have a new, well, Epic Times has a new documentary out, The Real Story of January 6th, Part 2. You might remember, we did the first documentary, The Real Story of January 6th, me and a colleague, Joe Hanneman. Uh, we showed you a lot of footage that has never been seen before. We got our hands on a lot of the unreleased footage. Later, of course, we did a special feature uh, where Epic Times was one of only three media that was actually given access through the House of Representatives to the unreleased video footage. We got our hands on a lot of that, we published it, and we showed you a very different story from what many of you have been told. We've now put together a new documentary, The Real Story of January 6, Part 2. And this one digs into the weaponization of the legal system, the weaponization of the federal government. And we show you some of the very, I'd say, unfortunate things that have happened with the court systems, with the way these cases have been handled. And this is a very, very important documentary to watch and a very important one to understand in terms of being able to discuss with your friends and family members about what has actually happened to this country because of the narratives of January 6. Let me show you a trailer for that, then we'll jump into some questions. Calling the January 6th investigation the biggest investigation in FBI history. There are more than 1,100 arrests, and they show no signs of, of slowing down. When you take an oath, you have to abide by it. They're just going to identify you on video, arrest you, and then figure out what the evidence is after that. Those involved must be held accountable. He's an innocent man, and he has been punished for something that he never did. Every day you wake up and you're like, how did I get out of bed today? You have to stay away from the word patriot now because that's a uh, terrorist organization. We interviewed two whistleblowers from the FBI. I sacrificed my dream job to share this information with the American people. That siege was criminal behavior, plain and simple, and it's behavior that we, the FBI, view as domestic terrorism. We started with death threats, uh, the hate mail. I don't care what they do to me, but I do care what they do to my family. Our family struggles every day. It's going to change narratives no matter what your political perspective is. Welcome back. That said, let's jump into some questions. First off, from Richard Honeymar, you're saying WHO, World Health Organization, controls the universal income. How much is enough, and by, way, by, by the way, where does all this money come from? Insanity, ignorance is the root and stem of all evil, according to Plato. Um, from what I understand, the WHO does control, to an extent, some of it, because they can argue that poverty or people impacted by climate change represents a global health crisis. And because the World Health Organization, although, you know, when we think World Health Organization, we're thinking pandemics and diseases and that stuff, they've expanded the interpretation of what constitutes health. And so gun crime can be, you know, a health crisis. Racism and inequity can be a health crisis. Climate change can be a health crisis. And as the whole world pays into the World Health Organization, the money we pay into them can be used for all these different programs and because they can recommend policies, uh, other countries that choose to follow the recommendations of the WHO or who choose to allow them in uh, will be dealing, of course, with their recommendations, which will include other branches of governments or um, of the United Nations even. And so, yeah, it does tie into a very large system, not just limited to the World Health Organization, but the WHO definitely plays a big role in it. We the people, you're saying, so we might run out of social security, which people pay into, but somehow a welfare state will work? <laughs> yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of very interesting posts around the, you know, paying into social security and Medicaid and all that stuff, and the actual money we get out of it based on inflation rates and so on. If you understand that inflation, uh, it's, it's been getting a lot worse, but it used to double about every 10 years. 
And so let's say you have you know, $40,000 in the bank for your retirement, 10 years inflation doubles, and so the practical value of that is divided in half. Even though you still have $40,000 in the bank, the tangible use of it is equivalent at the time in the future because of inflation, you know, maybe $20,000. And if you understand that maybe you're paying into it for not just 10 years, but maybe 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, and it's divided by two and divided by two and divided by two yet again, you can understand most of your money has been eaten away. And that, that does tie into, I think, just a system of just, frankly, government robbery of the average person under the narrative of, hey, it's for your retirement. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and, of course, we're also dealing with the fact that they've been eating into those funds to pay for other things. Um, a lot of millennials, people of my, I'm, I'm an older millennial, you know, but I'm technically a millennial. Uh, people of my generation are having to deal with that reality that there might, not, there might just not be any money for us when we, you know, when or if we ever retire uh, because a lot of it's been eaten up. A lot of the, the money has not been managed well by the government, unfortunately. And because of some of the tricks they use you know, in terms of inflation, uh, in terms of eating away at our wealth through that, through those means, and through others, through even trying to tax our money when we take it out. Uh, these various systems have just represented a very irresponsible way of using cash, a very irresponsible use of the money we believe we're investing in our own futures, which we're not, uh, because of the way it's being you know, used, unfortunately, by the powers that be. And we're coming to terms with the fact that there might not be anything for us, even though we've paid into it. And yeah, you know, you're dealing with the issue too that, heck, you know, all of us here are paying taxes. And if you live in New York, they're saying that everything is on the table to be cut. Policing, schools, uh, even basic sanitation, because the tax money we're paying money for that's supposed to benefit us, you know, that's a social contract. That's the nature of governments. We give a bit of our money, we give a little bit of our freedom in order to get services back that maintain some sort of you know, social cohesion and give us some benefits. The benefits are being eaten away because of the other crazy things they're doing, like giving free health care and free houses and free food to anybody who wants to come and illegally enter the country. Um, not for American citizens, not for, the, not for the people who are paying taxes, but for people who are violating our laws. What is the incentive then of paying, of paying into that system? And what does it mean as well when misuse of the fruits of our labor is being eaten away because of bad policy? It, it, it is going to raise some real serious qu uh, issues for, for us. And especially as, frankly, they keep giving these free handouts out, which is incentivizing people coming here in the first place. And so as you give more stuff out, more people are going to come. Uh, do you then institutionalize it? Is, is AOC, uh, Ocasio-Cortez, suggested just give them all citizenship? If you institutionalize it, you're not going to stop it. If you institutionalize it, you're going to maintain it as a permanent program. And maybe we will be stuck in a system of, hey, we can't house them all here, so maybe we start paying for their houses and free food and free health care in their own countries, which is, again, the policy we discussed today, where they, they're doing that already. Uh, this, is, this is the bigger picture of what's going on right now. <coughs> Seymour Butts. And good, good to see you back on here, Seymour. Seymour Butts, you're saying, if the U.S. is on the brink of financial disaster, why do foreign countries continue to want U.S. dollars? Um, so, when it comes to global finance, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different moving parts to it. I would argue that the Biden administration is, I don't agree with the way they're doing taxes, I don't agree with the way that they're trying to eliminate the idea of trickle-down you know, wealth and so on. I don't like the idea of how they're, in my opinion, ruining the incentives of hard work and starting businesses and instead moving towards a global corporate welfare state, as, as far as I'm concerned. But at the same time, you could argue that even though the U.S. dollar is suffering from really serious inflation and frankly heading into a very dangerous terrain where I don't, I don't know how much longer it's going to last, frankly. I don't, know, I don't know how much longer the economy is going to be able to take the bad policies. 
Regardless of that, the situation of the global economy is even worse. And if you understand that China, the Chinese Communist Party, was even trying to challenge the U.S. dollar, the CCP was trying to, during this time of economic you know, crisis for America, was trying to take advantage of that by starting up a global alternative economy, alternative uh, financial structure, alternative banks and everything like that. That agenda, although it's still going on to an extent, is not doing well. Arguably, it's doing a whole lot worse than the United States. And we're watching now the Chinese economy in free fall worse than we're doing, significantly. And as, of course, the system gets worse for them, and it's getting worse for other currencies, even though the U.S. dollar has its problems right now, and even though our economy is not doing so hot, it's ironically better off than most of the other ones. And um, blame what you will on it, blame it on COVID, blame it on the shipping crisis, blame it on years and years or decades and decades of bad financial policies in a lot of these other countries. The whole world went in on a lot of bad ideas around the same time, and it's impacting a lot of the rest of the world a whole lot worse than the United States right now. So. Yeah, it's not ideal here, but it's actually a lot worse in other places. And so the U.S. dollar, ironically, is comparatively, comparatively doing better than, than the others. And so because of that, it is still in high demand, interestingly. Uh, one of the reasons why so many people want to come here, right? Sandy Sefkick, you're saying, with all the things being unequal, how would a universal basic income work? Rent here in Oregon or California would be way higher than, say, Mississippi. So Mississippians would become rich while other people become poor. <sighs> Sandy, you're, you're noting one of the key failings of communism <laughs> and socialism in general, which is, keep in mind, communism is like the, the religious belief. It's the utopia. It's the, it's the religion of, of, of the, you know, what they have. Socialism is the system in which it is put into practice. Communism technically exists through the negation even of systems, but again, the process of creating communism will always take the form of socialism uh, because socialism is when you put it in, when you start using it. And you often see this. Um, <clears throat> it's one of the arguments, for example, that Ludwig von Mises raised in the problems. I'm a big fan of Austrian economics. One of the big problems he raised with um, you know, what he called state interventionism, socialism is applied to the way that the state tries to intervene in the free markets. Uh, he noted that because when you have a, when you have a one size fits all solution to something, it does not take into account the unique situations on the ground, which will differ country to country, state to state, county to county, town by town, and even person by person. When you want to have a universal program, you're going to find that it works okay in some areas, and it works horribly in others. And when you try to micromanage the winners and losers, you begin ruining the incentive of the winners wanting to try to do well. Um, and what you end up having happen is a collapse of the hardworking individuals, a collapse of the people who do well, and not, not a raising up of the people who don't. It is, a, it is a flattening of society downwards, not upwards. And yes, you could say that, you know, for example, redistribution might work initially because you steal the money from the people who decide to work hard. Over time, as they decide it's not worth the work, and they, you know, Atlas shrugs, like Ayn Rand says, you know, what's the point? The people who hold up the sky let their shoulders down and the whole thing comes crashing down. You often see this in, towards the end of every single socialist system. They go through the exact same process and you know what you note is, is one of the reasons why it always collapses. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's why it doesn't work, but here we are yet again trying it in a different form for, for some weird reason. Uh, Gina Michalik, you're saying, what happens when we no longer have any skills, when we no longer build things? Yeah, you know, Gina, this is a really, it's something I'm really concerned about. Um, you know, look, we all live in, I assume most of us at least, if you're watching this show, I assume you have electricity. You know, if you're able to plug your computer or your smartphone or your TV into the wall, I assume you have electricity. 
Um, if you live in a home and you have a plumbing system, and America, by the way, has a very good plumbing system. I can tell you traveling to other countries, including like first world countries, a lot of countries do not have good plumbing. Like you go to Greece and they, they don't even have flushing toilets in some places. You go to Korea and you might, you know, they have good toilets in some places, but in some places you're not going to have a toilet because they can even flush toilet paper. There are a lot of first world, very well-to-do countries that don't have the basic anemones that even very poor Americans have. And we take this for granted. Uh, really, you know, we take it for granted. We don't realize that these things might actually go away. We don't realize these things are not the norm. Um, if you go to India, for example, you'll find that even though, you know, they're a rising economy and they're doing pretty well in some areas, in a lot of areas they're not. And they don't have plumbing whatsoever. Now, we can all imagine how great it would be if we didn't have to do these jobs, if plumbers didn't have to go and toil in the sewer system or mess with pipes and so on and plug holes when things burst. Uh, how great that would be. Um, what happens though when you defer that to somebody else or to an AI system or just stop doing it, or you have people who just plain old don't want to do the jobs anymore. What happens? That institutional knowledge gets lost. The people who know how to do it do not pass on their knowledge of how to do it and the next generation is raised not knowing how to do it. You know, there was a really interesting article just recently that the Minutemen, um, you know, missile defense system the United States has, you know, of course the United States has a very large nuclear weapons arsenal meant as a deterrent for global nuclear war. They're having the problem that nuclear weapons have a shelf life. If you don't replace them, they're just not going to work like they're meant to, and um, we're not going to use them. If you have other countries that understand that the deterrent of using nuclear weapons is the threat of mutually assured destruction, you know, they don't use them because of that, and then they find that, hey, that mutually assured destruction is no longer there, what's going to stop our adversaries from using them? What's going to stop Russia from nuking Ukraine? What's going to stop China from nuking the U.S. or of doing a high Earth orbit nuclear detonation uh, for an EMP attack? What's going to stop them? Nothing. Because the issue of mutually assured destruction is no longer there and there's no consequences if they choose to do that. The interesting problem we're having with the Minutemen systems is the people who know how to build them, the people who know how to maintain them, are gone. We no longer have people who know how to retrofit, fix, or maintain those weapon systems because it was institutional knowledge. Uh, there's been articles noting that even the picture gu guides on how to do the work, even a lot of the guides have been lost. And so, yes, we could argue we're a society that has created advanced weapon systems that is you know, working as a global deterrent for nuclear war. Yes, we've achieved it. But because we don't have the institutional knowledge to maintain it, we're not going to have it forever. It's going to go away. And it's not easy to just go back and rebuild that. You know, we've seen this at various times in history. We know the Romans had advanced road building technologies. We know the Roman Empire had plumbing systems. We know they had very, tech I mean, if you go back in time, unusually advanced society, an unusually advanced society for the time they lived in. When the Roman Empire collapsed, people went back to living in, you know, huts with grass, you know, roofing in some areas. That institutional knowledge was lost. To this day, we don't know how some of these ancient societies did the things they did because we lost that knowledge. And so, even though you might live in a house with electricity, most of us don't know how to maintain an electric system. Even though you might have a computer, most of us don't know how to build computers. I'd argue the overwhelming majority of us don't. Even though you have a smartphone in your pocket, I doubt many of us would be able to build a smartphone. Now, when you start pulling out the pieces of the individuals who know how to build very unique components, who know how to maintain very unique systems, and eventually they just, we just, as a society, stop maintaining that knowledge, we will lose it. And once we lose it, we lose those pieces of our society. Um, now, keep in mind, 
there are, you know, if, if you look at Mike Rowe, you know, the guy who did dirty jobs, he's raised this issue a lot. There are certain jobs that are necessary for the maintenance of our lifestyles, whether it be the way that we do animal husbandry, you know, maintaining uh, farms for, uh, you know, the food we eat, whether it's raising of horses or the raising of cattle or the raising of chickens. There are very unique jobs to all of these things that are specialized. Without them, the abundance of food we have is in peril. Uh, it, can, it can be lost. Uh, there are systems that maintain very unique parts of our plumbing systems, that maintain very unique parts of the electric grid, very unique parts of even some of the core components that go into the materials and technologies we have. And the problem we're having as a society right now is a lot of younger people don't want to do those jobs. It, it's, a, it's actually a real crisis, like it, a serious crisis. You can only go so many years with people no longer wanting to do those jobs until you start having a, scarce, a scarcity issue. And that scarcity issue, if that does not incentivize people to take on those jobs, very likely at higher pay, which means we have to pay more for it, which means the cost of that service goes up and the wait times in terms of getting it done become longer. If people still choose to not take up those jobs with enough time, as soon as the people know how to do it, die or retire, that's lost. And when that is lost, every single thing that is maintained in our societies by that very unique institutional knowledge those things go away. This is one of the ways that societies deteriorate over time. Uh, we've seen it many times through the course of history. We've seen many empires rise and fall. That is one of the elements in terms of the fall of empires. That, that is one of the ways it happens. The, the ways of life we have are not etched in stone. The ways of life we have are not going to be forever if we don't maintain them. Um, California gal, you're saying, where will all this money come from for the climate welfare system? Well, from you and I, from the hardworking people of the first world nations, first of all, and eventually the hardworking people of every nation, as we have the people who choose to not work very hard or just plain old don't feel like working, um, being able to live just as well as the people who want to work very hard, even, even though, you know, they're not doing anything, right? Once you create a system of global equity, um, it's going to be a global welfare state. And you are going to have, again, the issue of what is the incentive. I mentioned that you know, when, there's, when there's scarcity, the prices go up, and the financial incentive for people to take up those jobs is there because you get paid more money for it. Remove that incentive, and why are you going to bother? Look, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a host of a show. I'm probably not going to go become a plumber. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> Nothing against plumbers. They make, they make a fantastic living, by the way. Maybe if things don't work out, I'll consider it. Um, but as soon as, as, soon as you start um, removing the incentive for people to take on dirty jobs or difficult jobs, people just, they're going to stop doing it. And yeah, that is going to be a problem for our society. Crash Bandit, you're saying, is UBI, again, those of you coming, that's universal basic income. Is UBI just another form of demoralization to the productive members of society? You know, that, that's a real question on the, the real, on the true nature of communism in and of itself. Because <clears throat> we could argue there are a lot of people who are true believers. They actually believe in the idea of equity. They actually believe in the, you know, the hopes and dreams of the communist movement. They actually think it's a good idea. And then there are people who understand, no, we don't actually care about equity. We don't actually care about welfare or the social good. We just care about power. You know, you, get, you do get people like that. And oftentimes that tends to be the communist leadership because once you institute it, you automatically have a leadership class. I really doubt that the George Soroses of the world or the, you know, the wealthy elites taking their private jets to these global climate summits, I really doubt that they're counting on the idea of living just as poorly as the poorest of society once they create their systems of global equity. 
I really doubt that you have them thinking they're going to be eating insects when during their big climate conference they have steak and lobster on their tables. I really doubt that the individuals jet setting around the world and their private, <laughs> had taken their private yachts and so on, going to their global climate conferences, not even carpooling in their private jets while doing it. I really doubt that they believe they're going to be living as well off as you know the poorest person in Africa once they institute global climate you know reparations and so on. They don't they don't think they're going to be impacted by it. <clears throat> and so I would argue at the very least this whole idea of you know the global good and global equity I I don't believe the people even pushing it believe in that. They believe in equity for everybody else. They believe in global equity for the you know the dirty underclass, all of us. They believe that everybody else other than them should just accept a lower quality of life for the good of those who you know are at the bottom of the barrel. And that, that's, the, that's what they're pushing. And then you have, of course, people who I would say are just legitimately evil. You have people, I think, who understand the true nature of communism. That communism is actually not about equality. Uh, communism is not even technically about power. Communism in its original sense was very much about destroying God destroying religion. If you get into Marx's writings where he talked about how anybody, that he would build his system, you know, high and tall, and that anybody who looked on it would be rendered, you know, dumb and sickly, and how he would walk in the ashes of destruction and by destroying the creations of God, become godlike himself. That, that's Marx's writings. That, that's the real nature of what he was hoping to do. It was about destroying the war. It, it, technically, it's, it's a religious war, right? <clears throat> it's about destroying the God-made world, about destroying the moral fabrics of society. And in doing so, you know, telling people, it's going to be great if you do it. You just got to do it first. You just, just do it first, and then you'll see the, the fruits of your labor. You just got to destroy your society, and then we'll live in utopia. There's actually a term for that. Communists call it the negation of the negation. You know, you have to destroy it to find out what, what, what it does. You got to pass it to find out what's in it. Does that sound familiar? You got to do it to know what it does. And of course, the people I think who truly understand the nature of it understand that it's not what you think it is. Uh, they, they, they sell you a narrative on why you should do it while intentionally, internally believing something very different. It's not for the global good. It's about their sick ideas of, you know, destroying human morality and destroying religion. It's about their sick vengeance against the, you know, the religions they don't like. Uh, that's what it's really about. Some, for many of them, including Marx, it was more in a hatred of God. And uh, that, that's true communism. When you, when you get into the real motives of the people uh, who I think truly understood it, not, not the true believers, but the people who understood what they were doing. It's, it's a very different narrative. Um, Carol Kedalive Savedri is saying, they won't get us via CBDC, Centralized Digital Bank Digital Currencies, but via digital IDs. <laughs> yeah. Well, and they're already working on that. They're working on global ID systems. You know, they're, they're pushing the real ID system right now. Um, in some countries, like China under the Chinese Communist Party, a very, of course, extremely totalitarian government that very actively persecutes all religions and only permits the, the skinned and gutted versions of religions that they themselves have taken over, altered, and then prop up as if they're religions, even though they're technically just religions of the Communist Party. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party does have systems like that, where your ID is linked in with your social credit score, your ID is linked to your smartphone, it's connected to your location, it's connected to every purchase you make, it's connected to every single thing you do, everything you look at, every person you're associated with, your family members, your coworkers, your friend circle, everything. And your ID is tied into every single part of every single thing you touch, uh, including, to that extent, even your uh, current, even your wealth, as they're implementing, of course, their, their own CBDC, the digital yuan. Uh, very much so, the digital ID is the foundation of that system through which they can implement the other parts of it. 
So yeah, that, that is uh, something to watch out for as well. All right, folks, that said, not to get too dark, geez. Um, <clears throat> I'm in Taiwan currently. I'll be here until early next week, and I'll be covering the elections. The elections are coming up this weekend, the counting of the votes. And as I've mentioned before, the, the elections are divided between three separate parties right now. The incumbent party, the DPP, which is actually kind of leftist. You know, they believe in all the global warming stuff and all that. But they are the anti-CCP party. And they're the party that is trying to get support from the West. They're the party that aligns with the United States and is looking to, you know, maintain Taiwanese independence. The main rival party to that, the KMT, although they don't state it publicly, is more the pro-CCP party. And they believe in leaning Taiwan towards the CCP rather than the United States, um, for the most part. And, of course, they're talking about reunification as it relates to the CCP's agenda for Taiwan, as opposed to maintaining Taiwanese independence. There's another group, the TPP, which is a bit of the middle ground party. Um, it's a very close race, and the vote that is going to be coming up this weekend is going to very likely determine the future of Taiwan. As it determines the future of Taiwan, this is going to touch on a lot of other things. Will the Chinese Communist Party invade Taiwan militarily? Will the Chinese Communist Party peacefully reunite, as they call it, with Taiwan? In other words, conquering Taiwan, not by tanks and bombs and guns, but instead through diplomacy or through engagement or through trade, which is one of the things the KMT is pushing for. Um, <clears throat> it's going to tie also into um, you know, real serious issues with the global economy, uh, especially with U.S. sanctions on China. It's going to touch on a lot of things. I will be covering all of this over the next few days, and of course, after the elections, I'll be releasing a special feature uh, which explains the deeper impact of whatever takes place. I'm here doing a lot of reporting and a lot of interviews, and uh, it's going to be important, uh, something very important to know about, folks. Uh, that said, um, hard at work here. I will see you all tomorrow, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. So tune in again. We have some great, great topics to go into. That said, folks, as always, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate all of you, and as always, Please take care of yourselves, stay informed, and stay free. Thank you.